<sighs> when will we get some clear skies? I don't want to have to take up astrology. All right, guys, enough of that talk. But needless to say, it's been extremely cloudy um, down here in Victoria, Australia. Um, it's been the theme pretty much for this, yeah, for this year. I mean, we've, we're getting an odd clear night here and there, but especially for, you know, deep sky imaging where you need lots of um, long exposures and to try and build up some data, it's been particularly hard. So anyway, today I've decided to get my cup of tea and I might just um, talk about have a bit of a general ramble. I'm not going to be, I'll probably, you know, go off on a few tangents, but I've got my Celestron C925 here and I was thinking to myself, okay, you know, we've got the planets sort of, especially Saturn now, beginning of September, starting to come up into view. So at least with the planets, I know that I'm not going to necessarily need that much time. You know, often those short video bursts is all you need. Um, so at least I've got some potential there to to get onto a <laughs> to get onto a planet anyway. So you know, grab a cup of tea if you want to, or coffee, and sit down and I'll just have a bit of a talk about my my rig here and um what I'm gonna change for moving it over just to my planetary imaging rig. Might be useful if you've uh, it could be useful if you're considering one of these types of scopes, a, a Schmidt Cassegrain could be useful if you've never done any planetary imaging just to get a few tidbits but anyway um, you know it's sometimes it's good just to talk about your gear a little bit so okay so those of you that follow my channel I've had this Celestron C925 now um, for I think it's under a year but it's getting on a little bit now I did actually consider selling it or um, you know getting rid of one of my scopes at least just because um, yeah, we've had so many clouds and I've had so little opportunity to use any of my telescopes that it, it gets a bit, um, wears you down a little bit eventually. But anyway, I came to my senses and um, I've decided to stick, stick with it for now at least anyway because, you know, it's the only scope I have where I can at least do galaxies. Not that we're getting much chance to do those at the moment. Um, and also for things like planetary imaging um, or close-up lunar as well. This, this thing's ideal. Um, what I will say is if you are considering a Schmidt Cassegrain, these C925 Celestrons, they're kind of a, a little bit longer than a probably a normal Schmidt Cassegrain, but um, I think what I've found with this is it's, hold, it's, it's held its collimation really well. And I don't necessarily think that's just unique to this particular scope. I've heard with the, um, with the primary mirror in these, they're a little bit slower than the other Schmidt Cassegrains in the Celestron range. So they hold their, um, you know, they're not as um, pernickety about um, collimation. Um, so I think they run at f2.3, I've heard, or something, the primaries, and it's two in the, the others, I think. Don't quote me on that. But anyway, what I will say is that, at least from practical experience, I've not coll collimated this scope yet. I am going to check it, of course, this season and make sure it's still reasonably looking reasonably good but I've been impressed by that and um, you know just generally I've been I don't really have any complaints it's not of course the edge version um, but still with this setup um, so I've got the, the 2600 the APS-C um, sensor the um, ZWO2600 the filter wheel um, the Celestron off-axis guider here and with a 174 mini camera in it. And then finally, I've got the Starizona um, corrector reducer, um, which again, highly recommend. They're expensive pieces of glass, these Starizona. This is the, the version four. But when it comes to the images that I've been getting, nice stars out to the edge of the field. So definitely no complaints um, there. And I would recommend um, the reducer as well. And then just at the end here, I've got one of these Barda click locks, these two inch click lock compression rings. Um, I think it just makes me also feel a lot safer about having all this just on a compression ring. Um, feels really, really secure. And also the way in which the ring sort of grips, 
it keeps everything nice and well centered as well so you're not going to have any sort of you know any sort of tilt there in your in your train so i might just take that out for now that's pretty much i mean if you want to look at it side on that's pretty much what the the little rig there looks like i don't know if that's focusing but anyway that's that so that's nice i can just take that out like that quite easily um just gonna shove that in there for a minute so yeah this um celestron c95 in terms of planetary imaging it's a nice size as well and um, you can either go like you know a two times barlow or a three times barlow in this um so what i'm going to do now is i'll just show you i'll just show you the little components i've got and then we can talk about why I've got the little components I've got or what's appropriate for, for planetary imaging. So um, this is actually off my refractor. So I just need something obviously to step this down because this is a two inch and my little Barlow is only a one and a quarter. So that's probably where I would start off and just place that in like that. Now I've got this Teleview Barlow. Um, I do have a two times Barlow, but I got this one second hand and I'm interested to see if I do see an improvement this year. Um, my other Barlow, very cheap, you know, very cheap Barlow. Um, these are normally, you know, Teleview are normally regarded as, you know, particularly good um, eyepieces and Barlows. So I'll be interested just to see with this, if I see, you know, much of an improvement. I do have a Celestron three times Barlow as well, so I might be testing that a bit later in the season. So that's all nice and secure now, it's all locked in. And then finally in my imaging train here, I've got my little ASI 224MC. So, you know, for those of you guys, maybe if you're new to planetary imaging, it's, um, you know, usually it's a bit different. It's not going to be, a, doesn't really need to be like a cooled camera like this. In fact, ideally for planetary imaging, you're taking really, really short exposures. You're not taking those long exposures. And you're taking video as opposed to single shots. Um, and then as opposed to deep sky imaging, you're stacking, you're basically using different stof software like um, AutoStacker and Registax to stack those videos um, into an image. So you can imagine with something like this, a planetary camera, you might be taking like 30, 40, 50 and more frames per second. You might be taking 30 seconds of video. So that's a lot of frames that you can then stack and to get the best frames, to get the best image at the end of it. Now, you know, I'm not an expert when it comes to planetary imaging. Um, I quite like this setup where I can just use one little sort of color camera. Um, I think in order to get probably the absolute best images, you know, again, mono is probably the way to go. But I'm, you know, I'm perfectly happy just using a color camera like this. There are a couple of rules out there in terms of matching your camera to your focal length of your telescope. Um, generally, the one that I'm familiar with is the five times rule. So if you imagine um, the, if you imagine the pixel size, um, in this camera, in the sensor on the camera, so the size of the pixels in microns, I can't exactly remember what they are in the 224, but I think they're, you know, three point, three point something, maybe 3.8. But basically, if you think about the size of those 3.8, and you multiply by five, so, you know, four fives would be 20, so it'll be close to 20. Um, that's the general rule of thumb for planetary imaging, given most people are probably in average seeing conditions. Now, it can change a bit, I think, depending on whether you're in particularly good seeing conditions or not. I think it can be six times. So do your own research on that. But as a rule, you know, to get you started, that's not a bad way to just sort of think about it. So I know that this combination of this camera and, and this focal length, you know, because this is F10, but with the bar lower at F20, so I know now, you know, five times my pixel size and I've got F20. So I'm about, those two are about matching. So that's um, going to be a good start for me. 
Now I also do have a planetary camera, the 4, I think it's the 482 or the 462, um, but it's got bigger pixels than this. And I, so I can use that particular camera with a three times Barlow. So three times Barlow F30. And I think the pixels on that camera are five point something. So I'm not at F, I'm not at 30, but I'm close to it. So I think again, this year I might do a bit of a test and see, you know, what comes out better. Does my, um, my two times Barlow, so I'm only going to be at, for example, uh, 4,600 millimeters versus my three times Barlow. So I've got like another 2,300 on those, so 6,000, whatever. Um, and then the combination of the camera, you know, see if there's much of a difference. So, um, you know, that's something that I can play with this year. But I'd advise you just do your own research on these things. Um, as with all astrophotography, planetary imaging is just another, um, should we say rabbit hole to fall into? <laughs> so, you know, there are people who mainly focus on planetary imaging and, you know, they're probably the channels I would go to if you want some really good advice um, on planetary imaging. But um, like any astro rabbit hole, you can dump a whole load of money um, into those holes, <laughs> as I found out myself. So this is my little setup for planetary imaging. And like I said, because this is a C925, I get reasonably close. You know, I think probably most people would say for planetary imaging, it's probably good to have like a C8, something that's about 2000 millimeters and up. Um, you can you can certainly do it less, but you know, that's for most serious planetary images, they probably have things like, you know, um, C11s, C12s, so you're getting up to like, you know, C14s, so you're getting up to really big focal length scopes, so you can get in, you know, close um, to that object. Um, and all I've got, just to go back to my camera, so all I've got on my camera is I've obviously just got a little, they come with these little, like little nose pieces that you can screw on, so they fit into the one and a quarter Barlow. So you can see, I don't know if you can see, but um, tiny little, you know, sensor in there. Doesn't need to be a big sensor considering how small that planet's going to be in our field of view. And then on the end of that, I just have a Optolong UV IR cut filter. I think, you know, I've got an Optolong, any UV IR cut filter will do. And that basically then just goes in the end of there and we tighten that up. Tighten that up. And pretty much all I need to do now is connect my USB cable to that, connect my USB cable to my um, electronic focuser, because that's obviously handy to have an electronic focuser, especially if I want to control it from inside. Um, and I'll be pretty much ready to go. The only thing I'm going to need to do is adjust the focus quite a lot because I've had my mono rig on. So I usually have that written down somewhere. How many steps through my focuser? I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's multiple thousand steps between the two. Um, and then I guess just in terms of generic advice for how you're going to first get that planet in your field of view. Um, because unlike most objects, you can't just really, you can't really just plate solve to a planet. So um, what I will normally do is get close to it manually myself. So most scopes, you can have a guide scope on the side like this. And what I will do is I'll go out to my mount, I'll unlock both axes on my mount, and then I'll manually basically control the scope and I'll get that planet in my little guide scope first. Now, of course, your guide scope is going to need to be aligned with your main scope. So take a bit of time, you know, beforehand and maybe during the day, get your guide scope nicely aligned with your main scope. On a distant object or you could use the moon on a night whatever you want um, but I know then roughly once I've got that aligned I can then come back inside and I can just use my controls on my um, imaging software to control my mount and I'll just have a bit of a look around and usually you know it might take you five to ten minutes some nights you get it straight away some nights it can take a bit of messing around and just get that yeah in your field of view and you're good to go um, now, of course, the planets are very bright as well, so you don't you really need, you don't need very long exposure times. 
But um, yeah, so now we're pretty much, pretty much ready to go. Um, all I need to do now is I need to wait, obviously, for some clear skies. And um, I'll probably set up a live stream. Um, so, you know, maybe watch out in the next few weeks if you're interested in having a look at the planets or how this setup actually goes in real life. And um, yeah, we'll um, set up a live stream and we'll um, get Saturn in our field of view and have a look how we go with that. Probably... Ideally, it's not going to be the perfect position for probably another month or so when I can get it higher much earlier in the night, but it'll still be pretty good. Um, I think I think Saturn from memory, I think Saturn from memory um, gets up to about, you know, 55, 60 degrees by, I think it might be midnight at the moment, beginning of September-ish. So, you know, it depends, it depends how you go with your timing as to when you want to try and... Um, when you can capture that image. But um, another rule of thumb for planetary imaging is try and have that planet as high as you possibly can in the sky when you're taking your images that you are hoping to produce your best image out of. Because obviously the, the higher up in the sky, the less atmosphere that you're taking your um, video through. So the better the quality of those images should be generally. Um, the other thing I'll say is it's a good idea. Um, don't be discouraged if your image on the first time or the second time doesn't come out amazing because the seeing conditions outside are a huge factor. And some nights you'll find that for whatever reason, you know, you look at the planet and it just looks a lot clearer than another night. And, you know, that could just be that there's some high clouds up there that you can't see um, and um, that can make a huge difference. So, you know, planetary imaging, there's quite a lot of luck involved as well uh, on getting a really good night um, of seeing conditions as well. So, look, I hope maybe you've got something out of that. Like I said, keep an eye out and I will try and do a, um, a stream soon. And um, yeah, clear skies to you guys out there in Astroland and um, I'll see you very soon.